Good evening, everyone. I'm Jackie Terraza, for those who don't know me, and I'm the director of the Kobe College Museum of Art, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to a very special evening tonight. Um, I am thrilled to begin the year with this program, which is both about a really fantastic exhibition that um, we have at the museum, Andrew Wyeth, Life and Death, and also about having an incredible artist, Jamie Wyeth, and an incredible scholar, <laughs> Tanya Sheehan, who is our own, um, who is our own William R. Keenan, Junior Professor of Art. I always have trouble with your title. <laughs> um, in the Department of Art, an incredible scholar, as I said, and I think them both at just from um, the bottom of our collective hearts for making possible this exhibition. As you know, Tanya curated it, and uh, Jamie uh, really brought forth the possibility of this exhibition, as you will hear a little bit later. Um, this exhibition is absolutely connected to our mission in a, diff in a variety of ways. It's part of how we open dialogue and create understanding about the changing um, stories of art in art history and stories of art in people's lives. Um, this is a body of work that wasn't known some years ago. And, um, and what does that do to the understanding of an artist and how a museum can contextualize that art to create the sense that history and art history are never complete. They're always in process and always open to understanding. And it's also about transdisciplinary research and teaching and how that sheds light, that approach of really thinking beyond disciplines as well as within disciplines in order to bring to life uh, new ideas about how we think about art and its place in our lives. So as you'll see um, in the, during the conversation and also if you've had a chance to walk through the exhibition or look at the catalog or read it, um, that these ideas very much come through. In fact, I'm, I'm curious, not to put anybody on the spot, but I'm curious how many of you have had a chance to see the exhibition, Andrew Wyeth, Life and Death. Wonderful, great, I'm so glad. And you will have more opportunities to do so after, um, after the program today. We are open until 9 p.m. and there will be a reception as well. I want to um, thank the supporters uh, of this project. The exhibition and the publication were generously funded by the Wyeth Foundation for American Art in part, and also additional support was provided by the 25th Anniversary Fund, the Payson Art Collection Fund, the Merkin Family Publications Fund, and the Barbara Alphon Exhibitions and Publication Endowed Fund, which make our exhibitions possible. I want to acknowledge the curatorial vision and work of Tanya, as I mentioned before, as well as the many museum staff members who realized the exhibition and who have been stewarding, as well as our docents who have been contributing to that educational project. And I also uh, want to thank a few people who are, I'm so glad that you are in the room. Mary Beth Dolan, um, I Thank you, um, as well as Mary Landa and also Karen Baumgarten is here. And they are um, Mary Beth and Mary Landa, our curators to Jamie and Andrew Wise, respectively. Karen Baumgarten is Associate Director of Research and Collections at the Chas Fourth Office of Andrew Wyeth. And without them, this exhibition really could not have been possible. And my final thanks before I pass uh, the microphone to him is to President Green, who is always creating new opportunities and new possibilities, and that is the case with this exhibition. It was when he became aware of this exhibition, of this um, body of work, in conversation also with my predecessor, that the reality of this show could come forward, and I'm grateful to you for entrusting Tanya as well as the museum with the project. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to you for an introduction. Thank you, Jackie. I'm going to be quick because I could listen to Tanya and Jamie pretty much all day, and listening to me is not so great. So, but I did want to say a couple of things about this because it's, um, it's an important moment for us having Jamie here. One of the great moments for me actually was this past spring when I was able to award Jamie an honorary doctorate from Colby. Um, his father, Andrew Wyeth, was awarded an honorary doctorate from Colby 
1954, maybe somewhere around there, right? And so bringing this full circle with a family that is just so extraordinarily talented and generous in spirit. And I want to say something about that. I don't want to, I hope Jamie will tell a little bit of the story of how he came to have these incredible scrolls and drawings that are in the exhibit that you see today. So I won't talk about that, um, but it's kind of magical. The time, first time he told me the story, I was just blown away by it. We were talking about this and he said he had these and people hadn't seen these before. And um, I said, I wanna see them, <laughs> of course. I'm like, can I see them? He said, yes, well, he said, I'm getting them up here. And we had a moment where he actually, we were out on his island in Southern Island and he had them all framed. They were mounted for the first time his hands were literally bloodied from the night before, putting these up until midnight um, that night. And walking into this kind of private gallery um, at his home and seeing these for the first time was one of these, you know, just take your breath away moments. Just extraordinary to see something that had been uncovered, discovered after a long period of time. And there are so many things that are special about them. But one of the things that was so compelling to me and that fits so much with the, the mission of the Colby College Museum of Art was that it showed a different side of an artist that everybody thought they knew. And this is the thing about reputations. Reputations naturally get distilled to something. They're not complex in terms of reputations. They simplify, overly simplify often. So you think you know someone, an artist, someone else, but oftentimes there's much more to them than what you ever see. And one of the things I love about the exhibits at Colby is we often show a different side of an artist than anyone has ever thought about before. And it brings to life somebody in a way that is much more nuanced, much more detailed, much more true to who they are. And I think that's one of the things that this exhibit does so beautifully in all of this. And I love that about it. It took my breath away when I saw it for the first time. I hope it did the same for you to be able to see an entirely different side. And there's something about those rough sketches and others that are just so, uh, they're vibrant and alive and unfinished in the best kind of way. You know, you can really see the artist at work and you see the artist in the mind and the heart. I think when I see this exhibit, and I love that part about it. And when you see some of the paintings that followed from it, and their psychic feeling is so different, and you also begin to see an artist working through one of the most fundamental things of our life, which is actually death, of course, through all of this. So I found all of that just extraordinary. So just one other thing I want to say, and I will, I will sit down, but Jamie and his family have been so generous to Colby. The islands, Allen Island, Benner Island, that now we've acquired because of a partnership with Jamie and the Wyeth Foundation for American Art are some of the most exquisite places I've ever been in my life. And if you haven't been there, we have to find a way to get you there because they are magical places. Uh, the history of them, the topography of them, the location of them, Betsy Wyeth's curation of them in every single way. You feel the love of the place, you feel the intentionality of what she did, and you see the beauty of it everywhere you go. One of the things I love about the islands, and Tanya was just out there, we were talking about this, every spot you go to is different, every spot you go to is absolutely beautiful. And the sense of beauty that's in the Wyeth family overall, I have to say, I mean, I'm just, I'm a total fan of the work of three generations of the Wyeth, so I'm, I, I won't go on and on about that, but I did want to say one thing about it because I know how hard Jamie works to be a great artist. He's got talent, talent, talent. But there's all different ways to express art today in a way that if you look 100 years ago, there was not. That's a wonderful thing. 
But what it's also meant, I think, is that being a painter in the truest sense is increasingly rare because it's not something that you can do quickly, easily. It's not a simple facility to have that. It takes practice and work over and over again. And one of the things, you know, that, and that's what Jamie does, his work is so deep and detailed and beautiful. And it's something that will stand the test of time for you know, centuries and centuries ahead. It will be with the masters that this is truly like the greatest work you know, of human civilization to see these amazing paintings and to see what that's like. That is something that to me is truly extraordinary and is such a gift to be able to see that and to have, be part of a place that was so essential for the Wyeth family for a long period of time. For Colby to be part of that, I have to say, this is something that is unima was unimaginable when I came here. And to now be in partnership with Jamie and his family to have these islands as places of inspiration and scholarship and teaching and respite is something that is just a gift for all of us. So if you haven't been out there, we will find a way for you to get there because you will walk those islands and you will feel the presence of Betsy Wyeth and all that she did there. And there's not one piece of that island that you look at and you know it's been carved by something larger than all of us in the end, but it was also carved by Betsy in the same kind of way. And it's a really special place. So I wanna say thank you to you, Jamie, and we could not have found somebody better to take on the challenge of presenting this work to the world. Now, I would just say the single worst thing that a museum director or curator can hear from the president of the college is, I've got a good idea for an exhibit. You know, <laughs> that is like, that is awful. You know, no one wants my ideas for an exhibit. But this was actually a good one. And, <laughs> but finding the person who had the sensitivity and the talent to actually bring it to life in a really thoughtful way you know, it was so nice not to have to look far and to have Tanya Sheehan, who is such a star, to be able to take this on. And so I just want to welcome you both, say thank you for everything that you've done. Jamie's my friend, and I have to say it's someone I admire so greatly because of his work, but because of who he is in his spirit and what that represents in the world. So to both of you, thank you so much for being here today. Up to <laughs> I'll say. Wow. Okay. Um, so should we talk about some art? Why not? Okay. <laughs> I so, first want to say, yes. can I just say one no, thing about I mean, what uh, David do. just told? Really, David was the real inspiration. I mean, when I had this idea, these drawings and so forth, and he and I guess the Lunders came to Alan Benaroun, and I had told David about it, and then. He said, well, let's go see them. And I had, so that, and I, you know, I worked like that getting these up and their response was just terrific. And how David has carried yeah. this thing on is extraordinary. Yes. And thrilling. And I was honored to be asked to do this project. Um, Great. It's been wonderful from start to finish. Um, so the centerpiece of Colby's exhibition is a group of drawings in which your father uh, imagines his own funeral. And the 16 of those drawings that we selected for display at Colby are derived from your personal collection, but also from the collection of the Wyeth Foundation for American Art. So I thought we'd start with the works in your collection. Mm -hmm. um, can you describe for us your first encounter with these drawings? And I'm gonna put a selection of them on the screen. These are the works from your collection we included in the show. What was your first encounter with them? And how did 24 of them come to be in your collection in 2018? Um, the, after my father died, I um, got a number of calls from people who said, you know, I have something your father wanted yeah. you to have or wanted to give to you or blah, blah, blah. And this, you know, there were numerous calls. And uh, among them was this couple. Um, and so I finally, after the 
10th call, I sort of dismissed these things. And it really, a year went by, mm -hmm. and uh, I thought, you know, I ought to call George and Helen Sapala, are their names. Mm -hmm. And they lived in this wonderful house and, uh, and um, that my father had completely taken over. Um, this was and, in Chad's uh, Ford, Right in Chad's Ford, and it has sort of a history of the house. Um, Howard Pyle, mm -hmm. who was the teacher of my grandfather, uh, used that as a summer for his students, for his summer studio. And then my father, as a very young child, used to, the, his doctor, Dr. Cleveland, was there. So the, everything my father painted and worked on had some relation to an important part of his life, and certainly this house. And so one morning, as I was told by the Savals, they looked out, and there was this figure sitting on their lawn, drawing, and they... I don't think they knew who Andrew Wythe was at the time, and um, finally they got to know him, and um, he just completely took over the place. But anyway, so years <laughs> went by, and um, so I returned the call finally after um, a year, and, um, and Helen said, well, I'm so happy you called, and uh, can you come over now? And I said, well, sure, I'll drive right over. So over I went, and there they were in their little room, and she described the story of how as I say, my father had taken over the top floor of this house as, as his studio, and he'd arrive at any time of night and day. And um, <laughs> Helen's father had died, and so in Pennsylvania they had this sort of viewing thing, which is sort of a horrible. Thing. But anyway, um, and um, she brought she had taken photographs of her father sitting in the coffin, and uh, and apparently the next morning as my father arrived, she showed him these photographs. Well, he went into a tailspin, mm. and, and as Helen describes it, he disappeared up into the attic, and he didn't see him for a while, and, and this went on. And, and so she told me this story, and I was just, I said, what do you mean? He was doing what? And she said, well, yeah. drawings. And, uh, and she said, some of them are enormous. Yeah. And um, so she said, she in fact had called the Brandywine River Museum to sort of say she had them and the person was disinterested. Well, she must have talked to the oh, janitor no, there yeah. or something, yeah. you know. <laughs> but anyway, and, and so with that, George, a little short time, brought these things down and started unrolling them. Oh. Well, I mean, you know, my hair went on end. And uh, I said, my God, these are extraordinary. And, uh, you know, they were all just rude. And she said, well, we were going to burn them. Oh. And I said, well... <laughs> Thank God I, I called yesterday. <laughs> and, um, and so she said, I think your father wanted you to have them. I think it's sort mm -hmm. of in the cards, and they're yours. So you had never heard about this project before? Absolutely not at all, no. I mean, he did many, many things in their house. But yeah. no, I had no idea about, uh, about these at all. I mean, as you properly said, in a lot of the drawings, the figures, he's repeating poses that some of these... Um, uh, friends of his and models had, had taken. So yeah. you could see other paintings in them, but I just was electrified. And then what fascinated me was just the sort of also the abstract quality of them. The yeah. sort of, I mean, particularly Kerner's Hill, which, uh, yeah. you know, had huge significance uh, for him. Um, Can you personally. remind everybody about that significance of Kerner's Hill? Well, I think, you know, as a child, he spent, you know, he, he was a great walker, and he'd go out for hours, even, I guess, as a child. And that hill became sort of a sanctuary. And um, so he started painting around the Kerners and the Kerner farm, which are these Germans. And, um, and then to really sort of tie it in with his, his apparently when his father um, was killed, um, he always regretted that he hadn't painted his father, and, and his father also that was... he hadn't painted him in death. Yeah. And so I was sort of fascinated by this. And he said, really, the, uh, one of the first tempers he did was a wonderful painting called Winter 1946. It's a figure running down the, the hill. There it is. And as he said, it was sort of, and he felt the hill was really his father's chest. Yeah. And that was he sort of lost and totally askew and just, uh, I mean, everything sort of topsy-turvy, as you can see. Yeah. So it, it was more than just a hill to him. It was, yeah. uh, had huge significance. 
because it, just on the other side of the hill where the train tracks are is where your grandfather was killed. Where he was killed. Yeah. So it, it you know, had enormous significance. Yeah. And, uh, and that was in 1945, so this was made right after that. Right after, yeah. yes, this was done in 46. So he, um, you know, he, he, for the rest of his life, that became sort of yeah. a touchstone. And, uh, and the, interestingly enough, the hill appears in a lot of paintings yeah. that sort of have nothing to do with Kerners, you know. Yeah. So it's, yeah. uh, it's, um, it's sort of the symbolic thing, but something very emotionally very strong to him. Well, the hill is very important in the funeral group series, as you know, and we see it represented here. I thought we could use this work, which is also in your collection, to talk about some of the figures in the scene. Yeah, well, the, the figure at the head of the coffin is Helga Testorf, who posed okay. for my father um, for years and years, and next to her is Mrs. Kerner. Right. And then my mother, with her hat, and then uh, the figure back to is Jimmy Lynch, who posed mm -hmm. for my father and for me for mm -hmm. many, many paintings. And then I don't quite know who it goes that's on That's Helen to. Zapala. Oh, that's Helen Zapala, yeah, okay. That's Helen and Zapala. the coffin was actually a, a co wooden coffin that uh, my um, mother's brother-in-law had made for my father years ago and, and had the initials A.W. on it. So as a child, when I'd play in the barn, I'd sort of <laughs> look into this coffin. And, uh, was it intended and so, for future And he, in use? fact, <laughs> is buried in that coffin. In that coffin, yeah. really. Um, and over here, is the figure of Andy Bell, who's another... Andy Bell, who was sort of a, a later, sort of a neighbor to the studio, and, and my father used him in a number of paintings, mm -hmm. holding the, the lid of the coffin. So with the exception of your mother at the center of the coffin, everyone else was a kind of neighbor in Chad's Ford who had posed... That, that he'd you. known for yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they weren't... And it wasn't sort of a hoked-up scene. I mean, he, these were people that he yeah. knew intimately, and... Uh, and, um, and so, you know, it, it made sense to put it in, but the whole conception of it being mm. his funeral is so yeah. curious, you know, it just, uh, and, um, and who knows what, if, whether he would have gone on with it. I mean, I always wonder, because oftentimes he would do studies, do things, and then go back to them years later, yeah. and then out of it would come something. But there you know. was never a final tempera for this. No, not that we can find. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Maybe some one of those yeah. twenty-five calls I got is sitting yeah. on top of a, <laughs> a funeral tempera, but I, you know, I haven't had the call yet. Um, so thinking about the selection of these figures, he could have chose chosen to stage this funeral scene in Maine with a different set of characters. Um, he chose Chad's Ford with this set of characters. Why do you think these figures were chosen and not others? Um, because, as I say, as a child, the, that hill, the mm -hmm. Kerner's Hill, was something very, very important to him. Um, uh, right next nearby is, a, is this wonderful octagonal building, which is now gone, the remnants of, which was a black church mm -hmm. that uh, he did endless sort of... Mm -hmm. uh, drawings and then portraits of the people, the inhabitants of the church and so forth. So, so that was a world that he, it was in walking distance of, um, of his home. And uh, so he, he never tired of it. He yeah. just kept going deeper and deeper and deeper into it. And, yeah. and which is so interesting about Andrew Wyeth in that he's, you know, the legions of sort of Andrew Wyeth imitators yeah. completely miss what he was doing. You know, I mean, they'll start on one side of the panel and work across. Yeah. Well, my father, who I watched work many times and posed for him and so forth, was a wild painter. I mean, mm. things would fly in the air, you know, things were spilled. Yeah. He would take advantage of the spills. He wanted yeah. it to. Yeah. And, and then in the temperas, they would be distilled mm -hmm. finally down to these almost airless worlds, yeah. you know. But it began in sort of this yeah. um, very sort of abstract wild, and these are, are indicative of it, you know. They're yeah, just, we see uh, that in some of these works, for sure. I'm thinking about this one up here. Well, and it's like a puzzle. I mean, a lot of his drawings, yeah. as I guess probably most painters draw, look like hieroglyphics, mm -hmm. but those hieroglyphics mean something to you, the painter. Yeah. And, like this. Uh, you know, I know Karen Bumgarn has been terrific going through yeah. and identifying where this is from and what yeah. that is from, which is fascinating. But, uh, and I think he liked working on top of other drawings, too. That's sort of fascinating. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, we see that on the, on the back side of many of these drawings or drawings for a different series or... Yes. Yeah, and I think he learned painters. that probably from his father that we mm -hmm. not long ago discovered a, a painting of N.C. Wyeth that under it is a painting of my father's that yeah. uh, he had just painted over and used right. the canvas. So, yeah, amazing. You know. <laughs> um, did it surprise you to learn that your father had pictured his own death? Had what? That he pictured his own death. Did that surprise you? It, it didn't surprise me because mm -hmm. death always, I think, intrigued him and, and you know, sort of terrified him as all of us. But then, mm -hmm. you know, it was a major part of life and his, uh, I mean, it, it, it's also that sort of, I always think, I mean, the, he and his father were terribly close and so forth, but diametrically opposite in their mm -hmm. work. And I always felt that Andrew Wyeth was almost a reaction against his father. I mean, his yeah. fathers, if you look at N.C. Wyeth, they're full of color and yeah. lushness yeah. and so forth. Andrew Wyeth is yeah. devoid of color. Right. There's nothing. Right. And uh, yeah. so it was, it was a sort of a funny reaction back and forth, and, and mm. death was a major part of that, I yeah. think. The, I mean, the skeletons of animals that he would do, the the trees falling to pieces. There he is as uh, Dr. Sin, and uh, um, he actually had his, his body x-rayed when he had an operation, I think <laughs> anticipating that he wanted to do a painting of his own bones in, a, in yeah. the painting, and that is, in fact, his skeleton. Yeah. And um, In a way, he'd been trying out the funeral group for decades as yes, a, as a concept. Yes, I think. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so it, it, it's something that... Uh, and you know, I mean, Halloween, for instance, is a, is a national holiday in my family. It's a, <laughs> one time we could dress up and go out and be in costume and so forth. Yeah. So, so there's that, and uh, it always was a big production with, uh, and, and still is in, in my house. Yeah, yeah. Um, what do you think motivates an artist to create something like the funeral group? Just an intense, I mean, his vocabulary, his language, uh, was paint. I mean, that's mm -hmm. how he um, expressed his emotions. Mm -hmm. And I think you, you know, he felt this very strongly. I mean, when you think of the amount of these drawings yeah. and it's probably a fraction of what existed. I mean, you know, yeah. who knows what he threw away. Right. And um, um, it, it's, you know, it was his form of speech and, uh, and unique totally, uh, totally to him. And, um, and I think the career arc of his is so fascinating because it was during the period where abstract expressionism was totally the thing. He was considered passe, don't you know, forget Wyeth, he's off there. And he totally stuck to it. And, uh, and this exhibition, interestingly enough, has had such a, I think um, people are starting to say, oh, wait a second, we ought to relook at this man's yeah. work, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's something more than just, well, it looks real or, you mm -hmm. know, every breath of grass. Yeah. I mean, they're very, his work is very peculiar. I mean, yeah. uh, I think in a way he's almost a primitive painter. Yeah. Um, right. You know, and you go to these places, yes, Kerner's Hill exists, but I mean, so many things are altered, so many things are left out, and yeah. Um, yeah. which he always loved the idea of leaving things out. He always said that. Christina's world would have been more interesting painting if she was not in it. <laughs> Which I think is a Yeah, I don't know if the world would far. agree. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. Um, so are you pleased to see the public engaging with his funeral drawings, um, given that he kept them hidden for so long? I, I think. I mean, why did he say to her, yeah. let my son know about them? Right. I mean, he could have just trashed them. Right. And, um, and so, I mean, I think... He'd probably be upset that he felt drawings were really personal things that you know they don't need to be seen. But, but in this case, the group, I thought, uh, yeah. it would have intrigued him. You know, he would yeah. have been uh, just fascinated. Yeah. By so, the reaction and and by the, uh, you know, not that he really gave a damn, but anyway, <laughs> but he, yeah. I think he'd be somewhat pleased. Yeah. So we have forty six. I believe, Karen's gonna correct me if I'm wrong, 46 identified so far. Are they really, of the um, whole series, so right? So you have 24, and there are an additional 22 that Karen identified right. at uh -huh. the Wyeth collection. So do you, do you think there's more out there? <laughs> I, probably so, you know, and he was, yeah. he was rather secretive too. Yeah. I mean, he, he um, you know, that whole Helga group, I mean, that was done without 
even my mother knowing right. about it, you know, and, right. uh, and he loved that idea yeah. that, uh, yeah. you know, I remember one day I went down in the cellar of my grandfather's studio <laughs> with him, and he had a whole easel set up down there, and yeah. he sort of loved the idea that his father would have been appalled that he was doing it there, and that's what fascinated him, you know, that, uh, <laughs> that he could almost hear his father's footsteps disapproving <laughs> above, you know. Yeah. So that yeah. made it... Um, all the more meaningful and, yeah. Uh, yeah. and fascinating. Yeah, well, I'd like to switch gears at this point and talk about um, Wyeth in conversation with contemporary art. Um, and as you know, Colby's exhibition puts the funeral group in conversation with the work of contemporary artists who explore what it means to represent one's own death. Um, the most recent work that we included in the exhibition is this work um, by Mario Moore, an artist from Detroit. Uh, it's a beautiful drawing. Beautiful drawing, yeah. it's a silver point drawing. Um, he's from Detroit and his self-portraiture was made in the context of Black Lives Matter. Um, drawings like this one, this is titled Fall uh, from 2017, reflect on whether black men can rest given their vulnerability to racial violence. Um, I think it's safe to say that your father's work has not been in conversation with work like this before. Right. And that's, um, I think, really crucial. Um, and you said the painter was aware of Andrew Wyeth. Yes, and it was that was what was remarkable, is we had a conversation with some of the contemporary, the living contemporary artists in the show, and Mario Moore said that he has been a longtime admirer of your father's work, uh -huh. and that he was honored to have been included in the show precisely because of that admiration. Right, fascinating. Um, so we also compare the funeral group um, to Meditations on Death by Andy Warhol, uh, with whom you developed a close relationship. Um, how does it feel to see your father's work in conversation with Warhol's in this way? Well, I mean, they had conversations. Yeah, they know. did, yeah. I, um, um, and um, Warhol was fascinated by my father's work, absolutely yeah. just fascinated. And, um, and um, these were actually... <laughs> house gifts he'd bring down he'd come for the weekend or something and so he brought this one weekend and um and uh, <laughs> they just save it to us and there's uh, there's another you reproduce in the catalog there was a wonderful one he brought one weekend of he with a skull on it. well there it is yeah. yes exactly and he actually gave it to my wife phyllis who didn't much like it and uh, <laughs> And I thought she was crazy, but anyway. She was probably and, wondering why this. Well, I know, and what I think it's just so him? wonderful. It's, yeah. I mean, it's so sympathetic of him and the whole, and um, I remember the Farnsworth was having a big fundraiser, so Phyllis gave it to the Farnsworth to sell. And, <laughs> um, and you know, much to my distress, but anyway. And they sold it for I, something like 800,000. Well, recently I wanted to find it and buy it back, and I thought, and I found it, and I was, it was offered to me for $33 million. Oh, my gosh. So it's quite a house gift, don't you yeah. think, for a weekend? <laughs> <you know. laughs> so he would come and visit your family in Chad's Ford? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, I mean, if you read the Andy Warhol's diaries, it's wonderful. He starts with, I think he was there for Thanksgiving or something. Yeah. And, yeah. and he said, um, and Jamie's aunt... Um, drinks a lot, so she must be a painter, and, um, <laughs> and they're just wonderful observations. Yeah. I mean, on the face of it, it's, it, you know, it seems that Andy Warhol and, and Andy Wyeth were two <laughs> diametrically opposed artists in terms of their work, but clearly there was a fascination with death that ran through both of their bodies. Absolutely, work, yeah. Um, that brings them into conversation in really interesting ways. No, I, I, um, when I was working with Warhol, I got fascinated. I've always loved stuffed animals and whatnot. And he and I found this place down on West 33rd Street that had all these stuffed people's dogs and whatnot. Oh. Um, he got <laughs> Cecil B. DeMille's uh, Big Dalmatian, and it said Fido, <laughs> Born, and Death, and whatnot. And I got um, lots of cats and dogs and collies and... And pool, which I still use, and uh, but he was kind of <laughs> horrified by them. I mean, really? he was sort of appalled that I really wanted yeah. these things, and um, so his his thing with death was sort of um, um, not sort of the Andrew Wyeth sort of yeah. spin on death. I think it's how would you describe Andy the, the difference? 
Well, and he was, you know, a very sort of shy person, oddly enough, yeah. and uh, and was very. I mean, he would sit in total silence, and um, you know, people would come down and said, "I had the most interesting conversation with your friend Warhol," and I knew his side of the conversation was, "Oh, mm. oh, really?" <laughs> and that was it, you know, and. Um, and of course, he bugged himself. Yeah. He had, you know, two microphones on his yeah. sleeves to tape every conversation yeah. as these people would pour out. So yeah. it, um, it um, anyway, he was a fascinating figure. And of course, yeah. my attraction to him also was he was kind of Halloweenish. Mm -hmm. you know, I love that the makeup. Mm -hmm. This man spent an hour every day before he went out putting makeup on. Yes. And yeah. eyebrows and hair. Yeah, you know. yeah. fascinating. Um, I'm going to keep having you tell us stories, because there are countless stories about your father playing with funeral iconography um, in both serious and comical ways. Uh, these are some photographs we included in the exhibition, for example, um, that document a trip that your father took with you as well uh, to fetch a hearse that he purchased from Louds Island in Maine. Um, and you can see that he's posing here with the hearse, um, in one case quite seriously, in another case not so much. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering if you could, excuse me, <clears throat> um, if you could tell us some more stories along these <laughs> lines of your well, father playing with funeral iconography. This particular hearse he'd heard about that Loud Zylan up until that time had used the hearse for funerals and it just mm -hmm. kept tipping over and whatnot. So they said, we gotta get rid of it and get a Model T or something. So. We went with a lobster boat and, and put it aboard a, a barge and towed it. And um, I think it was the following year, a couple years later, Thomaston has a huge uh, Fourth of July parade. And, um, and uh, we thought it'd be wonderful. Let's take the hearse in the parade. And my father was the bereaved widow in the front. And um, Frolic Weymouth, who was a friend of ours, was driving the horses. And a cousin of mine was a corpse. And uh, and it went over like a lead balloon. Yeah. I mean, you know, well, most people were crossing the themselves, <laughs> and uh, it was not appreciated. At one point, the horses bolted, and Denny, my cousin, flew out of the back of the hearse, <laughs> and I remember smashed his head. Everybody said, "Denny, you all right?" He said, "Don't touch it! Don't touch it!" And he got back in the hearse, so he laid out with the blood streaming oh my out. Gosh. It had even a worse reaction. Oh so, uh, but it, um, but those, are, I mean, that was, you know, I mean, the Halloween thing and that sort of thing. Yes, it was fun, but also there was a seriousness to it. I mean, there was a, yeah. um, I mean, the makeup, applying the makeup would be hours in yeah. his studio and whatnot, yeah. and. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't all just jovial and yeah. fun. And I think he derived a lot of things out of that, as, as I have. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk about your work, shall we? My work, oh my let's God. Let's do that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, these are two examples of your work. Uh -huh. um, we have The Raven from 1980 on the left and Portrait of JFK, which you're very famous for, um, from 1967. Posthumous portrait. In posthumous, which I'll never yeah. do again. That was, um, um, I was asked to do this thing. And so I thought, I mean, I was I don't know, 18 or 17. And, and at that time, President Kennedy was this deified sort of um, president. And so I... Um, I did this um, image of him, which raised people were so upset by it. They mm -hmm. thought it, um, you know, it, I mean, his eye wandering off, his sort of, uh, um, it was on the cover of I don't know, Look or Life or something. And I never got more hate letters or really? something. Uh, people really? were very upset by it because he was, at that point, considered blonde haired, blue eyed, neither of which he was. <laughs> and um, and I luckily I first obviously had to work from photographs and his widow showed me she took endless pictures of him and and so I sort of established a memory of him and uh, mm. and then finally I started a very romantic image of him and then I worked with the two brothers and mm. you know they're tough Irish politicians and uh, the, what I was working at none of that so I destroyed it and and did this. So it was reviled. Bobby actually hated it, but um, 
and it's now the national stamp in Ireland. You know, yeah. it's totally turned yeah. around as an image and become sort of a uh, yeah. uh, an image of him, which is so curious. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, when I was working on a portrait, um, a, a different portrait of this ambassador that I somehow got into, I was having the worst time because it kept looking like his dogs. And um, <laughs> finally I had dinner with a friend of mine, this was in London, and he told the wonderful story about Picasso when he did the portrait of Gertrude Stein. Mm -hmm. He worked on it for months, apparently, and brought it, finally, when it was finished, to the, wherever the flat was, Roferborg or something, and they unveiled it. And everybody drew back in horror. Mm -hmm. And somebody turned to a young Picasso, who was in his late 20s. It doesn't look like her, Pablo. And he said, it will. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, that portrait is the only reason she's remembered. Yeah. I mean, yeah. she's forgotten as a yeah. poet, sort of forgotten as a writer. She's remembered for that, mm. sitting for that portrait, which right. is an extraordinary portrait, yeah. Well, so is this. Um, and, a, and posthumous portraiture is one way, just one of many ways, in which you've explored the body and death in your work. Can you tell us what that looks like for you in your, in your work? Well, I mean, to be specific, for instance, um, I, I worked for a couple of years on a, a Russian dancer, Rudolf Nureyev, and, um, and, you know, I mean, there's certain things I wanted to do with them. Well, a, a dancer, their whole world is their visage, what they look mm -hmm. like. They spend all their time looking at mirrors. And um, so he was upset with certain things that I was doing and, um, and said, no, no, that has nothing to do with dance and whatnot. And... Um, so after his death, I was able to return to what I really wanted to do with him. And mm -hmm. I think it ended up being the most interesting of the work I did of him because mm -hmm. he wasn't. I mean, I'd never had somebody that concerned about what I was doing yeah. as he was, you know. I mean, he'd look at a hieroglyphic sketch of his tone. He said, my tone more beautiful, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Raise hell yeah. about yeah. it. And, uh, yeah. and so my reaction was to then to do these things after his death. So, yeah, that's interesting. Um, we're going to talk about another portrait that you've created after death. Um, yes, of my father. Yes, and you'd, you'd mentioned to me last year you were working on a portrait of your father. Is this that portrait? Um, I think it was my grandfather. Oh, your I grandfather, did. Yes. okay. This okay. I'd done a, a, this you a had few done years it. before okay. that. And that actually, the hand and the arm is actually a cast of his hand and arm. And my father, as I said with the suppose, he spent a lot of time breaking into people's houses and whatnot <laughs> and, uh, you know, peering from windows and so forth. So he, I thought this was, if you notice, there's paint all over his hand and uh, mm. he's unlocked the window. And, uh, and that, isn't that a wonderful um, dormer window, though? Mm -hmm. I think it's just fantastic. The blue, the sort of the blue of his eyes and so forth. Mm. It's kind of a spooky painting, though. Know? Like, yeah. It bothers a lot of people. Yeah. You know, but, Do you uh, like that? Well, I do, because, um, and, and my father, oddly enough, was a, really liked people and was, could be a lot of fun and so forth, so they always say, it's so serious of him. Well, he was a serious person under all that, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, so anyway, it's sort of my statement on that. Can you tell us at all about the painting you're working on of your grandfather? Um, yeah, I mean, that, it was very difficult. I've been working on it for like three years. Um, he's such a, of course, I never met him. I mean, mm. he died the year before I was born. Right. And, but his presence is so strong. Um, you know, as a child, I would walk up from my father's studio where we lived, and here was this enormous mm. studio with full of costumes and, <clears throat> you know, cutlasses and guns, all his props for his, for his, for his paintings. So, and, and the studio, the back rooms were full of all his illustrations. So I would just spend hours pouring through these amazing paintings that, uh, and then, you know, after a number of hours, I'd then walk back down and my father would be in his studio painting a dead crow or something. I mean, that was of no interest. To me, I thought, my <laughs> God, this world that N.C. Wyeth yeah. had created is, uh, is kind of fascinating. And it's, it's actually, it's very interesting now that we've, uh, I was given my grandfather's studio and I thought, God, mm. I couldn't work in this place. There's too many ghosts and 
so enormous. And um, and then when my father died, we gave the studio to the, uh, the the Brandywine Museum. And so they take people, and it's interesting, particularly for young people, to go to, first they go to the NCY studio, and as I say, it's full of the props and mm. all these notations and sculptures and things. And then you walk down to the Andrew Wyeth studio, and it's four walls. Yeah. There's nothing there. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was all in his mind. Yeah, I just experienced this on Benner Island. Yeah. I saw your father's studio, and right. I was struck by how sparse it was. Yes, I mean, yeah. just... Uh, yeah. and, and it's not to say that N.C. Wyeth didn't... I mean, uh, here he did Treasure Island. You know, he never went to the Caribbean. No. Um, Robin Hood... King Arthur, he never went to Europe. Yeah, yeah. It was all in that studio where, and, and Daddy would tell me that, you know, when he was a child, NC Wyeth would go up and lay a painting and come down, cook them all breakfast, of which there were, you know, seven of them, and say he had to leave because the smoke was too strong up in the studio, the gun smoke. I mean, can you imagine? Yeah. He was electrified, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's why his, yeah. you know, illustrations still resonate with, uh, with young people. I mean, they're just, uh, and at the time when he was illustrating, there were, of course, mm. no television and whatnot. I mean, these things brought these stories to life. Mm. And they're big. You know, N.C. White paintings are large, yeah. knowing they'd only be reproduced right. this big. Right. And my father says because he wanted to jump out and grab you by the throat, you know, when you open the page. You say, yeah. I have the collection. My grandmother gave me all his books that the publisher would send him the, the um, without illustration, of course, and he would go through and do little drawings mm. as he. And it interested me because he always picked the thing you'd least sort of do. It was always before something happened, mm. or just that, not the middle of a battle or yeah. something, which yeah. I, which I think got people's imagination going too. That's fascinating. Yeah. So why do you think you've turned to your grandfather now as a? as a subject at this point in your career and your life? Because, I mean, I adore his work and, um, and um, the whole history with my father. I mean, my father knew his work inside and out, could recite everything that he painted. So that intrigued me. I mean, here was this figure bigger than life, yeah. who I never met. Yeah. And, um, um, and then a very complicated man. He, I think... The relationship with his son was was very difficult in terms of, I mean, they adored one another, but there was a certain competition there. And uh, I mean, I remember my father telling me a terrible story. He he had sent a painting to some exhibition in Philadelphia, or the Carnegie, or something like that, and he got a letter saying the painting had been accepted, which was a huge thing. So he rushed up to his father's studio to tell his father. Mm. And his father's painting had been rejected. Oh. You know, I mean, oh. that's, that's a tough thing, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah, So there was that, you know, back and forth thing. And I think N.C. Wyeth sadly saw his illustrations as sort of work stuff and not very interesting. In fact, they're the most interesting of his paintings. Mm -hmm. Because when I think, I mean, his others are fascinating, but when he would do his easel paintings, it was as if now I'm a painter, I'm going to, you know. Yeah. Whereas the illustrations were, you know, the story, and that was this great strength. It was yeah. all that. Uh, so it's, um, it's, a, you know, that that relationship, and um, yeah. and um, I mean, there was a wonderful biography done on my grandfather by David McAllis, and and I came out of that biography thinking, God, I don't know if I would have liked him as a person. Yeah. I mean, he was very sort of filling the room and yeah. controlling, and uh, yeah. So it would have been uh, difficult. And I think my father's relationship, I mean, my father's whole life was sort of battling, you know. And, and anyway, it became yeah. a, a very important thing in his work. Yeah. And, and there's not much relation between Andrew Wyeth and N.C. Wyeth's work at all yeah. that I can see. And, um, yeah. But, you know. But you see a connection between your work and N.C.'s. Um, I think, or probably the medium, I mean, the fact that I work in oil and, mm -hmm. and certainly more color than my father's mm -hmm. to a degree. And, um, and I've been doing fairly large things of people behind doors and things, real doors. And so mm -hmm. that, I mean, my father sort of, you know, diminished, you know, 
yeah. took the size down and yeah. whatnot. Well, we look forward to seeing it when you declare it finished. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd be, um, yeah. be interested to see. Um, it's had a very, I mean, I've just sort of, sort of started to finish it. And my, I have a cousin who knew my grandfather. And, um, and I think the whole trauma of his death and whatnot, she was probably, I think, six or seven or whatnot. And she now comes to see that painting once a week to really? sit for an hour really? just staring at it. She says, it's so my memory of him, you know? Wow. So that's worth it to me. Yeah, yeah. She's declaring yeah. it done. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's okay with you, I thought we'd open it up to the audience for questions. Oh, um, yeah, sure. Should there be any yeah, questions? Probably, I believe there are microphones probably that are one. going around. <laughs> Uh, Chris will come and find you. <laughs> okay, microphone is coming. <laughs> It's my understanding that um, the Dr. Sin painting was a 60th birthday present for your mom. I was just wondering whether you might have attended that birthday party and have a backstory in regards to <laughs> whether it was it a total surprise to her or, um, or had she seen him working on it before or, you know, it's a, it's a slightly weird painting to be receiving for a birthday party, just like the Andy Warhol one, I guess, would have been as well. But yeah. uh, There is sort of a big story. The canon that you see to the right, um, um, my father and I said, wouldn't it be wonderful to get a canon person to come out and fire the canon? And then, you know, then your mother can come down and look at the painting. So... <laughs> <laughs> We went, this cannon person, and my father and I went into the, this is in a bell tower, which is part of the lighthouse where I now live. And um, so, and he had all the tools, and the, he, instead of cannonballs, he had a tin can full of concrete. So we rolled the cannon back, loaded it, and uh, if you see to the left of the cannon, or the, where you tie it down, so when it, well, we failed to tie it down. <laughs> and so, you know, we touched the thing off, and there was this huge explosion. It blew out two of these windows. Um, up on the hill, my mother and the rest of the family were all cheering because they saw the thing. We crawled out with our hair all frizzed, <laughs> totally blackened faces. <laughs> Needless to say, it's the last time the cannon was fired. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but it was a bit of, could have been a really bad disaster, yes. but luckily it wasn't, yes. uh, you know. Uh, uh, are there one or two pieces of advice that your father gave to you that you'd like to share with us? Um, he, he, you know, he always said he was a terrible teacher. And in fact, he was, he was wonderful in terms that he would sort of, I mean, if I were working on a portrait or something, which, and for a while I worked in a room next to it in his studio. And so he would walk in and out. And, um, but he would talk about the form of something. Jamie, just think of the, the sound going in, the thing. And you know, it just brought it more to life than if he'd taken paint from my palette and repainted, which his father actually would do with his son. Yeah. And so I think he learned that I'm not going to touch the damn yeah. thing. You know, Let him figure it out. And, uh, and so it was, uh, he was uh, wonderful in that. And, and then the, the final thing, uh, this is really the last time I saw him in the hospital, he pulled me over and whispered and said, give him hell. <laughs> those, <laughs> those are the last words. Of, uh, That's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> I think we probably covered the gamut. <laughs> it's kind of uh, rambling, but uh, with the funeral series and the sketches, um, his father, I, I read an essay a number of years ago, and I don't remember the title, by Susan Sontag, and she described death as event 
and death is process. And of course, his father died death by event. So Andrew had no time to grieve. When somebody is in the process of death, we as the living have an opportunity to grieve and to help them towards death. So I'm wondering, could it have been that this process of the funeral series, which is very secretive, was sort of an ongoing um, grieving, mourning, just of death in general? Well, I, I don't know. Um, I, I think his father's death was, of course, totally unexpected. He was in the height of his career and, and so forth. And, and what my father said in the ensuing years, that it galvanized him. In other words, he said, before my father's death, my opinions were clever watercolors and you know, rather swish and whatnot. And he said, after his death, it was like that figure running down the hill. It just, then I had a real reason to paint. So, mm. so the abrupt death certainly changed his career. And, but it's not to say that the process of somebody slowly dying, and clearly in this funeral series, it's the, you know, there are all the mourners and so forth. It's obviously a planned thing and so forth. So it, uh, um, it, and in fact, he said when his father died, he went to see his, and the whole idea of the Kerners Hill really being his father's chest and, and Jamie, you, I hope mm -hmm. when I die that you draw me. Mm -hmm. And I did. I went in right after he died and, um, and sat there for like three hours. Now, I haven't revisited the, the drawings because it was such a sort of terrible thing at the, yeah. the time. But it was sort of amazing. Mm -hmm. And then I remember specifically drawing his right hand, you know, that now was totally still, mm. that produced these remarkable things and, you know, moving fast over things. And as I say, when he worked, paint would fly, things would spill, knock over, and here it was silent, you know, yeah. it was pretty extraordinary. Have you ever shared those drawings with No. Him? No. Yeah. I mean, I, maybe I will sometime. In 30 years, there'll be an exhibition. Yeah. <laughs> At Colby, and Whether David Green will be it. here. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Championing. <laughs> yeah. The Andrew White funeral, yes. I like that idea, though, that this was his opportunity to think about death as a process, and he put himself at the center of that process um, and envisioned the ideal community that would be engaged in that process. Um, the people who were closest to him, mm -hmm. um, the people in his professional life who were closest to him, because not all of his relatives were there. Right. right? The models that right. were closest to him, your mother being included right. in that group. Sure. Um, this was a kind of farewell in, the, in his professional circles, but the, he always blurred professional and personal. These, these people were also his family. Right. So that's um, a really interesting idea. I mean, he was aging at this time, and other members of his family had recently passed. Um, so this is the early 1990s. That We don't know a specific date that these drawings were made, but um, Karen's best guess is 1991 to 94. So that's the range over time. So it's, it, was, it, was an, it was a process itself that took years for him to develop uh. the idea. Yeah. And the scale of that, I mean, certainly yeah. these small drawings, but those enormous this things one's massive. are really extraordinary. Yeah, not as big as this screen, but yeah. <laughs> you will see it's about a quarter of the size, but large, right. very large. And that was a departure for him, working that yeah. size, you know. I mean, that was a real departure. Yeah. So why did that trigger yeah. it, you know? Yeah. And then he abandoned it. Yeah. Probably thought it was too much. I mean, who knows, you know? There's also a very large-scale watercolor um, that we see in the exhibition view here on the yes. title wall. Yeah. Which is the only watercolor in the series that we've identified. Right. Um, but very large scale. 
Yeah. And I love the drips and the thing. Yeah. It's just wonderful. Yeah. No, I, you know, as I said, my hair stood at end when I saw these things. Yeah. When they unrolled yeah. them, I was almost passed out. Yeah. Anyway. yeah. Any final questions for Jamie? Yes. Um, I'm curious if there's a specific site on the island that has significance like Kerner's Hill. On the uh, main islands? On the Allen and Benner Allen Islands. Allen Benner. Um, I don't think so. I mean, the, the Kerner's Hill was a lifelong thing. Um, my father, as a young person, spent just hours rowing around these islands and just adored them and so forth. But I, I can't say there was one physical uh, thing that he kept returning to, um, purely because of the time involved. I think it was less, less time. I mean, this... Kerner's Hill, when he was a child, that was important to him. And, and the one you have reproduced in the catalog, or I guess it's in the show of, of my aunt, Anne McCoy, mm -hmm. uh, 90 Winners. Yes. Well, it's not that she's buried in snow. I mean, he, she loved a sled. And so his idea was that's her head sledding down the hill. I mean, you know. <laughs> and, and that whole thing, I remember him describing to me, he went to the funeral home and um, Helga was with him, and she wore a big coat and under all his paints and what time passed. And he went to the funeral director and said, I want to see my sister. And, you know, and, and Helga said, he needs to be alone with his sister, so shut mm. the door. And, of course, then he opened all his paints and sat and did that painting. Mm. It was pretty amazing. You know, it was yeah. sort of a, quite a tribute to her, but, I mean, yes. something that he didn't feel should be seen. And, you know. No, that's been kept very private, and yeah. it was really the, in our catalog is the first time it's ever been reproduced. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah this is a remarkable head. It's like a death mask. You yeah. Know, just fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the islands are a different story, and it's interesting that he chose to stage this funeral in Chad's Ford, even though he's buried in Maine. Mm, yes. So there is, is interesting that that was the choice. Yeah, I think yeah. That, a lot of that was my mother, but um, because the Olson, the Olsons were very important to, to the two of them. Yeah. I mean, the, I mean, when you think my father met my mother, and within half an hour she took him to the Olsons, yeah. and this is the place where people could, they thought she was a witch. I mean, here was this woman dragging herself around in the chairs and whatnot. And that started 50 years of him painting there. Mm -hmm. I mean, that day, he sat there and did. Well, tell me, she, as a 70-year-old, didn't sense something in him mm -hmm. to take him there mm -hmm. because she, as a child, had been raised, you know, had cared for Christina, would comb mm -hmm. her hair and so forth because she would be down the hill. So it was a totally, but, and it was sort of a test, I'm assuming, that C. That, yeah. that James was sort of testing this guy, you yeah. know, and, um, and um, it's so funny because <laughs> apparently her father had taken some friends over to meet N.C. Wyeth, and, and as they were there, young Andrew Wyeth came through, and so my mother's father, Merle James, said, um, I have some very pretty daughters, you ought to come over to Cushing, me and my daughters. <laughs> well, two days later, of course, he went to Cushing, and uh, as he was... Honey, and for the driveway, here was the, side, the mailbox, and it said M.D. James. Mm. So he drove in, and, and uh, there was somebody, I guess, cleaning the house and said, nobody's here and whatnot. And uh, all of a sudden, upstairs, young Betsy James came running down. And, and so they met. And um, within 20 minutes, <laughs> uh, my mother said, well, what do you do? Mr. Wyatt. He said, I'm a third year med student at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. Mm. Of course, he saw the MD James. He assumed her father was a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so that was his first fib to my mother. Oh, <laughs> He'd my known goodness. her for exactly 20 yes. minutes. Yes. So, anyway, <laughs> but out of that came a great relationship, and they yeah. went down to Olson's. Yeah. She took him down there. So it, uh, you know, it was uh, tied in. I mean, you know, that became a such an important part of his life. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so in the Chad's for and that's why he's buried there, and I think yeah. my mother felt that, you know, this is 
yeah. mainly because she loved the Olsons and so forth. And, uh, yeah. and it's sort of wonderful. I mean, he's all over the place, but, you know, but um, it's kind of marvelous. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here tonight well, and sharing all these wonderful stories. And, well, thank um, you, Tanya. You've done a wonderful job. The exhibition oh, is great. Thank you. Just terrific. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> hey. I guess we, we bow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>